Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are and whenever you are. Thank you for joining me on another community live stream. This is the episode, or this is the show, I should say, that takes a deep look into our community where I, Chuck Tomasi, the ServiceNow guy with the cool lavender bow tie today, goes through any number of ServiceNow questions, problems that you pose in the community and try to help. And not only give you the answers, but give you the thought process that goes on behind the answers. I am going to take one second to, pardon me, I'll go through the rest of my introductions in just a minute. My name, as I said, is Chuck Tomasi from ServiceNow. I've got to clean my glasses because I cannot see what's on the screen. Go through ServiceNow questions. I've been with ServiceNow for about 10 years. Started as a customer in 2008 and uh, came over to ServiceNow in 2010 after my previous company had a reorg and found my position no longer necessary. And I have been doing professional services, pre-sales, services enablement, and now I am officially in marketing, believe it or not. <laughs> I can't believe it. It's still surprising me. I wake up every day and go, what, what? What? What happened here? So thank you for watching today. Let me make my head a little smaller and remind you that this is available on YouTube at the URL you see right there. What would that be? Right there. There it is. Go to that URL, subscribe if you like. You get notifications of not only this show. Let me make sure that notification comes up. YouTube has been a little bit sketchy. There it is right there. Service now is now live. That'd be me. So you can get notified of that just like I do when you subscribe to that channel. If you find something helpful in the next hour or so that I cover that you think is useful, you might use at work, check that like button, flip that little thumbs up thing and give me the like. It will indicate to others there is something helpful in this video. I'm not sure what it is. My mind goes every which way on these things. I try to explain what I'm doing and sometimes that leads on interesting journeys of discovery. And if you discover something interesting, let me know. If you are in the chat room, give me a shout out. Say hi. We do offer this on YouTube as well as Twitch. Oh, I should mention that the ServiceNow Community Channel also has two new playlists that I've created in the last week or so. One for CreatorCon 2018, where we have almost all, I will say almost all of the breakout sessions, whether it is Dave Slusher and Josh Narius talking about how they use ServiceNow to automate the... Um, a uh, live coding happy hour. Excuse me. We will be doing a live coding happy hour a little early today. I believe Dave has it scheduled for 8.30 a.m. Pacific time. So some of you in uh, Europe and India and maybe elsewhere can watch. So that'll be in about two and a half hours from the start of this show. Live Coding Happy Hour is available. I'm just going to jump around a little bit at the URL you see there at the YouTube channel for the developer program. You can see that there, I am going to switch that back now. The, um, where did I go? Oh, the playlist also contains a lot of other breakout sessions, whether you are interested in service portal or integrations or metric based machine learning. There's a lot, a lot of creator con content there. I believe I uploaded 53 videos, not just uploaded them, but teased them off of hard drives that had multiple issues, be they video or sound or whatever. Uh, I wish I had all of them. We do not have, any, have anything from the developer theater, unfortunately. None of that had any audio, and it wouldn't be very interesting to watch hours and hours and hours and hours of video with no, hour, with no audio. We could do a bad lip reading, I guess. <laughs> that might be entertaining. Uh, we also simulcast this on Twitch. I noticed that some of you are joining there. Thank you very much. Just had a good discussion yesterday uh, with one of my two days off with my co-author of Podcasting for Dummies, T. Morris. He is going to be writing a book called Twitch for Dummies. So good luck to him. He didn't ask if I wanted to be a co-author on that, probably because I don't know a whole lot about Twitch. I can't offer much, but I may, he said, yeah, he may be calling on me and who knows, maybe I'll be uh, mentioned in the book as doing a stream. This show was actually inspired by that man when he was here about a year ago watching Twitch. And I said, Tweet T, what's the deal with Twitch? Why do people, why do, why would I want to watch a video gamer play a video game rather than play it myself? And he said, because they're the subject matter experts. And hey, I said, I'm a subject matter expert at ServiceNow and I'm doing the community an hour or two a day. Why not? 
let's give this thing a try. And you people have proven that it is a, it is uh, valuable and it continues to go. So as long as I can do this and you find it valuable, we can meet here each morning or afternoon, if you prefer, 1 p.m. UTC to do this. Let's continue through the introductions. Good morning, Jason. Good to talk to you. Jay is in the chat room. How to set database view between SC request and sys approval approver. Uh, if user raises a request, Jay, I'm going to ask that you post that in the community. That is go, goes a bit beyond. If you do have a question, please post that in the community so that others can benefit from this question and you get more subject matter experts than just me. I may not be the end all be all knowledge of all things service now. As much as some people claim Chuck knows everything, Chuck does not know everything, and I will admit it in public. It's it's not that simple. Good morning, the Da Vinci Technology. Love the handle. I had a Da Vinci robot work on me earlier this year for surgery. Those are cool. I want to learn more about those. Where was I? Twitch? Yes, we did Twitch. That means uh, the community. I mentioned if you do have a deeper question other than just giving a shout out of how you are, where you are, good morning. Uh, you're welcome to join in the discussion. If I do get stuck, you can throw in your comments real time. But if you do have a deeper question about things like database views, please post that in the community so that others can help you. Please, please remember, only post once. I already saw a message this morning that was posted at least twice. And uh, that makes it difficult for people to follow, difficult for people to answer, difficult for other people to find when they're looking up a question. It was actually a developer question. They posted one in ITSM and one in GRC. We have these various sub forums within the community and uh, I didn't find any logic as to why they were there. So please make sure you post in the correct area so that you can get the best audience for your question. If you do have a GRC question, obviously post it in the governance, risk and compliance uh, sub community or actually they're just called forum is forums it's groups forums whatever it is now that's a group if you go over to the communities you can find it here if you want to know more about that all forums are available on that menu as well so i encourage you look around i think that's actually buried beneath, no it's not quite buried beneath my title the community is a wonderful place and has our on-demand library of knowledge 18 just go to the Knowledge18 menu, click the session content, and you will find that we are working on putting links to the videos from the YouTube channel. There are links to the content from the videos. So we got links going one way. We don't have links going the other way yet. I don't know who's going to take charge of that. Probably not me because I don't have a, the ability to access the content. Uh, where are we? Where are we? Thank you for the kind words, Da Vinci. I'm just going to shorten the name up there for a second. We are, we did the community. We also, I just want to encourage you to go to the developer site, developer.servicenow.com. If you haven't done that, you can get a free personal developer instance that is found over here. Still with the old branding. We're working. We're working on it. It's going to be a phased approach to get everything to the new logos. You can see some of this has new logo, but the title bar is still the old familiar white and red. Excuse me. Uh, you can get a free personal developer instance. There are also all of the scripting APIs, which we may or may not be referencing during this hour. If I get stuck, I'll go look for it and get it in there. I don't remember every class and every method for everything. Again, Chuck doesn't know everything, but I usually try and help and try to remember where things are in terms of, of reference. We may also be referencing the docs site at docs.servicenow.com. So one has documentation about the functionality of the system. The other is about the, the detailed implementation, the scripting, if you get into scripting. You don't have to do scripting in ServiceNow. I just want to make that clear. You don't have to. It's, it's, an extens it's a way to extend the capabilities. You can also find information about, uh, let's see, free developer instance, APIs, uh, the share portal is now over there. So if you go to share, you can find all kinds of applications, code snippets, service portal widgets, lots of good information over there at share that uh, you can download for free. You just need to have an account on the developer site. Seems to be a little slow this morning. Not sure what's going on. Big white screen of boredom behind me. Let's... Uh, <laughs> Page loaded and did not go anywhere. Huh, wonder what that was all about. Let me go back to share home. We may have an issue to report. How share works. There we go. There's the home page. I can also go to all projects 
and start filtering and looking things up that way. I can even look for my projects. My project should be on here somewhere. I'll find it later. Oh, I'm not logged in. <laughs> that was fun. I'll log in later. Do that if we need to go to, you don't have to log in to get the APIs and whatnot, but there are also meetups on there. Maybe it'll even remember that who I am. Watch this. Let's see if the, the magic password genie is still available. Good morning, Fibsy. Good morning, Nitin. Good to see you. Screens of nothing. Okay. Oh, it did remember me. Look at that. I didn't have to log in. And now I should have... I could do create project. The events... I'm kind of going in a chaotic order this morning. You give me a couple of days off and I can't remember what's what. We have meetups. Meetups, meetups for developers, developers, developers. All right, that was a terrible Steve Ballmer reference, but you get the idea. Let me put this away. And you can see a little bit more. Also, want to remind you, this is a partial list and is manually updated at this point. We are working on an API over to meetup.com, but that's where the real good goodness is at meetup.com with the URL you see on the bottom just to the left of my neck. Or is it the right? This side. This side, yeah. The link is right there. Over at meetup.com is how we organize those. If you go there, you can find out if there is a developer meetup in your area and you can attend. If there isn't one in your area and you want to get one started, let us know. We can get you uh, set up as an organizer. We will support you. We're not going to do everything for you. You need to find the venue. You need to uh, uh, you know, host the meetings. But that's about it. We'll support you in other ways. We've got material. We've got topics you can borrow, you, we, all kinds of good stuff. If you want to start a developer meetup in your area, if you just want to check one out, maybe you happen to be out of business travel or, or a personal vacation and you're traveling through one of these and say, hey, family and I are going to be in Auckland, New Zealand on uh, from the 15th to the 20th of July. Maybe I should check out the developer meetup in Auckland. That would be fun. I've done that a, a couple of times, usually on business trips. I, had, I don't interrupt the family trips with the developer meetups. That probably wouldn't be cool in, in, in uh, my situation. But uh, depends on, on who you are and what you are and maybe what your kids do. Maybe you know, there are, we do have families out there where the parents and the children uh, work with ServiceNow. So that would be an interesting event to have for your family vacation. <laughs> Just saying, could be your cup of tea, might not be your cup of tea. We also have other events coming up. This is uh, getting a little out of date here, but we'll try to keep it up to date. If you go to the events page, however, you can find all of the events. I'll update this again on Monday morning so that you can see it there. But if you use the link on the bottom or near the bottom, you can find uh, more events as they happen, as they appear. There are more being announced all the time, and I broadcast those over to LinkedIn and Twitter and Zing. If you happen to be on any of those social media networks, I encourage you to follow me, and you will get those updates as well as other news that about digital transformation or artificial intelligence or whatever we find in our social media catalog, I'll share it and you can get it that way as well. That takes care of the introductions. Let us go to the community. Again, community.servicenow.com. And I'm going to do a refresh. Good morning to everybody. Thank you for joining. This is Friday, July 6th. 6th? Yes, the 6th. July is moving along just faster than June was. And I have one thing in the inbox. I was responding to a couple of threads just before the show started. So let's see what we've got over there. I already have an inbox open. I don't know why I did that. Just refresh that screen. Can you configure inbound email so it only shows the whole chain? This is a question. This is this is one of my first questions that I had when I joined, uh, started working with ServiceNow as a customer about 10 years ago. And... The question is, they've got uh, email coming into the system. And when it posts to an incident, for example, they're getting the whole chain. So if, if a mail has been bounced back and forth and back and forth, whether between two people or ServiceNow and a person, they keep getting more and more stuff added onto it. And it gets longer and longer and longer. When you look at additional comments added by in the activity history, which I can show you, 
on my developer instance that I got from developer.servicenow.com. Make that a little larger so you can see it a little bit better. If I go to, say, an open incident, the activity history, if you're not familiar, is the comments and work notes and field changes that have been configured to be saved in there. Come on, finish loading, dear form. Down here, and you would see that email getting longer and longer, and they said, I only want the most recent reply. That is available through a system property, which is very easy to configure. And somebody said, this is, this is the uh, same thread. Yes, there is a system property in here that says discard everything below this text if you found in a reply body. Uh, it could say, it, it, it is comma separated, so we've got two values in here. New line, new line, original message, new line, new line, underscore, underscore, new line, new line, from. You can configure and say, look, everything below this pattern is throwaway. It's not relevant. We've already seen it. I don't need it. And these two are common for Outlook, I believe, if, if, or uh, uh very common for other mail clients to be sending and receiving. And when they put the reply to a reply to a reply, this is the pattern you would see. I had to configure it slightly different. I added a third pattern that says, you might see this as well. I don't remember exactly what it was, uh, but it was. It, it, I put it in here and it worked. And then it says, discard everything below this line. Somebody configured it for uh, just new line, new line from. They said, that's my cutoff point. So you can change this. It is case sensitive, apparently comma separated case sensitive. So make sure you don't spell from with a lowercase f or it won't see it. So that quick discussion we had off of that. I'm going to look for any unreplied messages. See what we can find. Help with push approval and workflow. Push approval. Let's find out what that's about. I'm not sure what push approval means. Haven't heard it before. I have an issue finding an approval to push. Normally it's not an issue, but when we have a table that is just filled with users, you exception managers, we also have a request. I'm going to make that a little bit bigger. We also have a request where I'm referencing a table and whoever they pick would get the approval. Normally I would just push them by the variable. Okay, so they're creating an array. Answer.push. Current.variables exception manager. And it, this is a reference field, I can tell. It's a little bit hard to see, but there is a magnifying glass and an info icon. Normally, I would just, we also use, have a request where I'm referencing a table and then whoever they pick would get approved. Normally, I would just push them by the variable, but for some reason, this time it's not working. It just skips it. Any ideas? current.variables, they're on the requested item. It's not you exception manager. Double check the variables there. I would say double check the variables. You could also double check your variable name to ensure it is current.variables.exception manager not you exception manager. It is a reference variable and it points to that record in the table, which means, which means, why wouldn't that be working? I would also throw a log message. You could also use a log message to find the values. Value, how about value singular of you, ex uh, excuse me, current dot variables that exception manager. Let's see if I can spell today. Exception manager. And check the log. GS.info. EM equals, I'm not going to be very big with this. Current dot variables dot exception manager. Old-fashioned way of debugging. Dump the output and go see what it says. All right, there's one. Let's have fun with the bell. Close that. How to extract a selected data from rolling list of business service to send 
to the report via the jelly containing the lit. Wow. <laughs> this just sounds like a whole bunch of words strung together. Uh, they're in performance analytics. I, you know, I, because of this crazy description, I have to see if there's a deeper context to this. This sounds like, uh, what are you trying to do? I'm looking for a method to update the selected data of a of business service to send it to the script in Jelly. This allows us to extract records of incidents if the selected data is equal business service incident or incident service. Is it possible? If yes, may you send me the script, please, because I don't script well. Of course, I try to work it. <sighs> this sounds like you might in performance analytics and reporting. Sounds like it might be uh, a larger implementation that might require some um, professional services. But I am going to, regardless of not understanding the problem, I'm going to try and help. Can you please state the business requirement that is driving this? It sounds very technical and I'm having a tough time understanding how the jelly factors into this. Aside from the technical requirements, what is the use case or business requirement? Oftentimes, when you understand the context, again, I've stated this a number of times, but if you're new to the video, first of all, welcome. If you're new to the video, then under it's imperative that you, as a developer, as an admin, as an implementer, understand what the requirement is. If it just says, you know, spit out a report, find out deeper. What is that report for? What is it driving? What is the context behind it? Uh, what is the need to have that field on the form? What is the, it, it's, it, it, it may seem trivial at first, like, hey, we need a checkbox. Okay, why do you need this checkbox? What is it doing? Do we have another checkbox that might do the same thing? Understand, don't, don't let them dictate the technical requirements to you, like we need a checkbox. Because uh, they may not have the full, you may not have the full picture, and then later they say, oh, we need that checkbox to be mandatory. Well, you know what? Checkboxes can't be mandatory. Yes, you can check the thing that says make it mandatory, but there's always going to be a value in there. Mandatory means there's no value you have to fill it in. It doesn't mean you have to check it because checkboxes have a value. True, false, zero, one. It always has a value. It's never null. It's never nothing. Therefore, it's always filled in. It, it Putting mandatory on it has no effect. If they say we need a checkbox and later have a requirement that says make that checkbox mandatory, you change it to a choice list that says yes, no, true, false, on, off, whatever the the, the condition may be, you know, passed, failed, that that's a different requirement. So get the context, understand the problem as a whole, ask questions if you still don't understand everything, and make sure you understand so you can give the best possible solution. There's my free advice of the day. I think I'm just going to put that down on my weekly list. We'll make it either Monday or Friday. will be free advice day. Thank you for joining. Thank you for watching. Hope you find it informative. Let's continue on with some more questions. Country flag display based on group. Oh, this sounds entertaining. Sounds like a customization. And let's find out. Yes, I'm making assumptions. Could you please provide me with a solution to the below requirement? I want to display the country flag based on group. Example, U.S. citizen group. Vamsi is a member of the U.S. citizen group. India citizen group. Krishna is a member of the Indian citizen group. If I select Krishna, I want to display Indian flag. Uh, yeah, this is, this is going to get interesting. Where are they getting the group from? Sys ID, sys user GR member, therein lies the problem. Okay, what if you're a member of two groups? What do you display? Okay, this is 
this is a, a lot of jelly script, and I'm not going to go through all of it. Wow, it is a lot of jelly script. Okay, since sys user gr member is a many too many table, I knew exactly what I was looking for when I started this. It's possible and quite likely that any user can be a member of zero to n groups. You are making a bold assumption that they are only of only in one group. I know. Whoa. Oh, interesting. What do you expect to happen when someone is in two groups? Are they going by? I just got to look at this script a little bit more. This is jelly, so I'm not going to get too much into it. They're looking up group name, US citizen, group image, US image, displaying images. I forgot. Images are a little different. I want to see how they propose to do this. You're using an image tag. I haven't done images in quite some time, so I'd have to look. Um, but I know where I can look. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep this on the side and and look at how images are set up. But first, I want to know in more than one group. <coughs> okay, there's my question of the day. Again, understand the requirements. Look for exceptions, because those will have to be put in your code, too. Say to yourself, what happens if I've got a string field and someone enters a date? What happens if I have a date field and someone enters a string? Or a bogus number, or a date in the past? Start looking for these, and you will produce a much better solution. Otherwise, it's going to pop up in production, and then you're going to have an emergency change, and nobody wants that. It's Friday again, isn't it? Ah, uh, the dawn chorus is here. The uh, garbage trucks are coming by. For different source type data sort for different data source types, where does the actual command get run from? I didn't know we had a uh, forum called Architects. Let us see if this is here. So I'm new to this and have a question regarding integrations and where they run from. I'm, I've looked at the ServiceNow documentation and it's clear on the JDBC one, but not on the others. I understand that JDBC connections run from the mid-servers, but I'm slightly confused as to where others run from. File ones, such as SFDP or SCP, I would assume run from the mid-server. Well, it depends. It depends. You only need a mid-server if you are connecting to resources inside your organization. Organization. If your instance in the cloud has direct access to a service such as the FTP server, the REST API endpoint, etc., then you don't need a mid server. The commands or protocols are initiated directly from the instance. And just for fun, let's go to the docs page. Hey, I made it to the docs page. And give them basic information on mid-servers. Ah, that's a good place to start. Copy the link. Docs, mid-server. Link copied, link pasted. Command K, everybody. Find out what your keyboard shortcut is and be more helpful in the community by pasting links. There we are. What's next? 
widget query help. All right. Hello, I have a requirement where to display most recent and most ordered items, and we achieved it, and it is working fine, but we also have another requirement where it should not show the items ordered from order guide, and that to one particular order guide as of now. Okay, can someone help me with this query? They're doing SC catalog is, SC catalogs or SC catalog. Show prices is SP, da, 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 da. data limit is options limit or nine. Array of items, here's the user. Get their user ID. They're doing a glide aggregate. They're doing a query, 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 count catalog item. Group by catalog item, order by aggregate. Is that a valid method? Data items equals items, and then count dot cat item dot name get the display value. Glad aggregate is not going to return you those records. Glad aggregate is going to return you a number, but you don't have direct access to the items that it counts. And I think that is the fault right there. Okay. The thing to understand about glide aggregate is that you don't have access to the items you count. It doesn't retrieve the records, only the results of count, min, max, average, and sum. Uh, if you want to do this with a count and retrieve the records, you need to use glide record. Ta-da! Okay, glide aggregate is a wonderful thing. It is, let's just put it simply, it's a superset of glide record in terms of the methods that are available. However, it does something very specific. It uses database functions. If, you, if you've got any SQL experience, you know what, I'm just gonna write it out here in a text editor. But when you say glide aggregate, you instantiate it just like a glide record on a table. And you could say add query, just like Glide Record. Glide Record is our primary API for accessing the database, for doing record updates, for creating new records, that sort of thing. And I can say active true. And I also have another set of functions, methods available to me called add aggregate. And in this case, I'm just going to count how many active incidents I have. Okay, then I do a GA query. But what this does under the hood, I'm gonna write it in a JavaScript comment, is select count star. This is a magic thing that the database knows how to do from incident where active equals true. Uh, that's not the exact syntax. I believe it's actually more like active equals one. But the idea is we are not retrieving the records. This is wholeheartedly different than select star from incident. This gets records. And then you can use the glide record. So here's the glide, glide aggregate equivalent. And here is the glide record equivalent. Oops. Now you're saying, gee, they look awful similar. Well, they are similar in that they both have a query portion, a filter portion, the where statement. They both pull from the same table, but the key difference is you are doing a count. You're telling the database, I don't need all the records. I just need the metadata around that. The big difference in these two is performance. If I'm doing a glide record query, let's say I have 250,000 incidents to count. It will take 
maybe two seconds. And that doesn't seem like a whole lot, but when you're waiting for a browser refresh and you put this in a business rule and the business rule runs a couple of times, you are now holding the user hostage for a few seconds, which seems like an eternity. People will question whether your app is broken or not. They will start to curse at ServiceNow saying, it's slow, it has performance problems because you used a poor choice of queries to simply count records. Now, we could do this async, whatever it happens to be. Good morning, Snehal. Good to see you again. The, um, so the Glide record can take a long time. Now, if you've got five or 10 records, you're probably not going to notice that big of a difference. Glide aggregate is good at counting records or averaging or some min, max, that sort of thing. Does a number of functions. You can even group these together and say, count how many are in this category and how many are in the next category and the next category. You can configure it a number of ways to group by these other parameters. It just returns the counts. It never got all those records. So you don't have access to field one, field two, field three. You can't do your dot walking. It is a computation engine, if you will. Use it that way but if you need to get the records to do something further, like update them or delete them, hopefully you're not deleting records in service now. If you are, rethink your logic. But that's the primary difference between Glide Aggregate and Glide Record. Down at the database level, one is doing a get me all the records. And if you want, I'll return you a count as well, because I figure you're going to be doing something with these records. The Glide Aggregate is, just get me the, the metadata for the, those records. How, what's the average of the temperature? That kind of thing. Okay, so that's where we get into the difference between Glide Aggregate and Glide Record. Important that you understand the distinction between those two so that you use them both effectively. There isn't a right answer or wrong answer for when you, when you should use those is up to you. Adding new system properties, 15 replies. Well, I'm curious to see why it took 15 replies to answer this question. Okay. There's, a, there's a doc page created yesterday. Is it possible to create new properties and from there we can change the assignment group to any task? Suppose we have five catalog items. From each of them, only one catalog task got created separately. And I have fixed the assignment group for each RITM's catalog tasks. Now, I do not want to change the assignment group name from the workflow. Rather, if I have to change the assignment group name from the properties, it will fruct it. Someone is, uh, they're on the right track. System properties are a wonderful way to do this. If you are writing your own application or you're extending or you're configuring other applications, consider using system properties. They are very important. However, however, don't change the system property all the time. It is meant to be a system property. You can reconfigure it. I would say if you're doing this, if you're reconfiguring it automatically, you're going to have problems because system properties, when you change them, they flush the cache, which means all your performance is negated. The system uses a cache for forms, for, for lots of things. There is an onboard cache, so it doesn't have to go to the database and rebuild a lot of this stuff on the fly. It's already cached. That's what a cache does. When you set a property, it flushes the cache because all the properties are kept in cache. It needs to flush the cache. So if you've got something that changes more frequently than say once a day, <laughs> consider using it in your own table. All right. Uh, I have a fixed assignment group for each RITM's catalog task. Now I do not want to change the assignment group. I already said that. If so, Let's see. Uh, you're thinking in the right direction. Anurag is a very uh, prolific person in the community and very smart as well. I can attest to that. Uh, that is, in fact, one of the best practices. Instead of hard coding things in scripts like workflows and business rules, one should create a property and read the property from these scripts. I'm also going to add on, don't hard code the sys ID in the property. Okay, it seems like, well, how do I get my assignment group then? Assignment groups are sys IDs. I've shown this uh, in the last couple of weeks. There is a method you can use called set display value. Yes, Anuraga, it would be really helpful if you can help me out with this requirement. 
To add a property, just navigate to the Properties table, sysproperties.list, and add the property. Give it a meaningful name, meaningful and unique name and value for the value of the group case. Okay, then you can use gs.getProperty of your property. Properties are often delimited with dots. Doesn't necessarily have to be. There could be underscores in there as well. But if you look at the names of existing properties, use those as a model for how you name your own properties. If I were going to name something for my Chuck application, and it wasn't scoped, you know, scope obviously helps eliminate a lot of these variables because it will put the scope in front of it. It will say x underscore six seven three three five underscore Chuck dot. Okay, now give me your name, and it will put that all together, the scope and the property. But if it wasn't scoped and I was playing in the global space, kids, don't play in the global space. <laughs> then you can give it your own unique name, but make sure that it is, in fact, unique. Uh, can you let me know how we can use this? It means we have so many catalog items from which one catalog task can be created, and their assignment group is fixed, and I want to change the value. Where is it fixed? Uh, and I do not... And do I need to add any category to that property? No, not necessarily. Category is not necessary uh, unless you want to put it on a page, which I can show you as well. Okay, but I do not want it for one catalog item. You can have multiple properties and read the property according to the catalog view. It means different properties for different groups. Right. Got it. Thanks. All right. How? <laughs> I think I found a way to create a new property. Wow, they are really getting through this. This thread is getting pretty deep. I love all the indentation. I'm going to add one thing. I'm going to add one thing. Let's see. Anar. Da, da, da. I gotta remember how to spell his name. It's been so long. Anarog is doing a great job guiding you, guiding you through this. I'm going to add one more tip. Use a display value for the property value. Use a, use a proper name. Use the name of the group. Let's not talk too technical. Never know what the level of the person is. They haven't done been doing system properties, so this might be confusing. Use the name for the group as the value for the property instead of a society. Societies are hard for humans to read. <laughs> Which is why, I'm gonna scroll that up a little bit, we have something called a display value. Example, your property, um, my assignment group has a value here. Let's call it my default assignment group. Has a value of, you know what, let's call this. Your group that you want to use as a default has a name Mm, default group. <laughs> Again, not very imaginative today. And a sys ID of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, O, A, B, C, D, E, F. You know what? Let's uh, start with zero. Then, well, no. All right. All right. That's 16, we'll just duplicate that. That's 32, that sounds like a society, right? Define the system property, property, as my default assignment group with a value default group so it is easy to read and change when you go to use it 
you do this. Uh, var group name equals gs.getProperty by default assignment group. And you just pull the group property out of the property table with that. And then set the group value by name. You can do this. You're saying, but Chuck, the group name, the group on the record is a sysid, right? But you can do this, set display value, group name. And as long as default group is unique, which I would hope it is, it's not, doesn't have to be by default, but if you have two groups with the same name, you have other problems. Then you can get that updated that way. I know, I could have put that in a little code box. Good morning, Rahul. Good to see you. We are at a quarter to the hour. And I thought I had something that I wanted to talk to you about. And that was, oh, reference icons. There was a thread that came up late last week. And some of you may have seen this because I did see it on another instance when somebody was, uh, I was, I was helping somebody with something Tuesday, Tuesday morning after I did the last show. And they saw this as, uh, that we're on their instance and I saw this. Their reference icons, I think this is a Kingston patch six error, although I haven't seen it and my personal developer instance is on Kingston patch six. So I don't know what to tell you, but if you've seen this, you get this little eyeball icon, which I've never seen. Normally you would see this little letter I. I, I, I don't know. Maybe somebody got the homonym wrong and said, I need an I icon. So they made an icon that said I. This is hiding somewhere in the system. I, where it is, I don't know. And they came up with an interesting solution. They called support. I said, I've never seen this. I don't know where it's coming from. They called support and they got a system property that they could set. And definitely we're not seeing the eyeball icon default here. However, I do see it in the icon list. I've never seen the icon list. I don't know where it's from. And they said, if you use, this is a little hard to read, so I'm going to type it in the text editor so you can see it, glide.ui.clickthrough.popup. What they did is glide.ui.clickthrough.popup. And support told them to set it this way. It's a true-false field. And normally, the only thing I've ever seen in a true-false field is true and false. The words true and false, like T-R-U-E. Since we're on the topic of system properties, that means it will come out as a string. So be aware if you are using system properties for a true false value, it doesn't mean you're going to get a Boolean. You are going to get the string T-R-U-E. Okay, I, I can show that again, but I want to finish this up first. They said false equals I. I've never seen this format before. True equals I. And it got fixed. Make sure I'm reading that right. False equals I, true equals I. Never seen it before. I don't know how that worked. For fun, I thought I would try this on my instance and flip these around to see if I could get the I icon. Okay. I went to my personal developer instance. I went to system properties and I created a new property. First, make sure it's not already there. Okay. Let's copy that and do a search for name equals glide.ui.clickthrough pop-up. Not there. So we can create that. Note a shortcut here. I think I have this somewhere in, in my notes. This will pop up on TechNow eventually. I didn't mention TechNow on the, on the startup. Okay, next Tuesday we do have, oop, get rid of that. Back that up. Wrong keyboard. We do have a TechNow webinar coming up. TechNow episode 54 on the script debugger. Register at the link below. Look forward to seeing you there. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. Now, this is a true false. And the value, they said, could be like this. Now, I said, submit that. 
I have a new property, it flushes the cache, it should be doing a whole bunch of cool stuff behind the scenes. And I went to an incident and I still see the letter I. I don't know. And I thought, well, maybe I need to log out. Who knows? So I logged out and I logged back in and tried the incident again. I can't get this thing to do it. I don't know where that eyeball icon is coming from. But if you, I just want to mention this, if you have this issue where you're seeing an eyeball icon and it's driving you crazy and you don't know why, give this property a look and see if it solves your problems. I'd be curious to know your feedback on this. It wouldn't be the first time somebody mentioned an issue and a resolution that I couldn't reproduce. It happens all the time. So false equals I, true equals that means it's not really a true false. Okay, the other point I was trying to make is, let me find a true false variable in here. There's one. Glide.ui.listv3 enable. I'm going to take that and write a little script that says var listv3 equals gs.getProperty that. And if I say gs.info to get some output, type of list v3. I just want to know what type this variable is. Go into scripts background, which is a nice little playground I can test in. Paste that in. It says, congratulations, you've got a string, which means I would not be able to do, say, if list v3 I have to treat it as a string. This is not treating it as a string. This is treating it as a Boolean. Else that. Let's put in if list v3 is here. I can hit tab. I'm actually in a text editor, not in a web editor. GS.info. I'm a single quote guy. List v3 is on. Otherwise, gs.info, list v3 is off. This can come to bite you. Even though the value is currently false, watch what I get. It says, you can't do that. You have a syntax error at line 8. And line 8, which is right here, I have a pipe. Dang it. <laughs> this is a typo. All right, paste that new one in, and it says list v3 is on. The value was false. Okay, type of, and stop that. Something wrong with my text editor. Plus value equals list v3. So how do we get around this? Well, the lazy programmer in you might say, gee, Chuck, if it's false and it's a string, why don't you go like this and say equals false. Eh, that's not treating it like a Boolean. <laughs> the other option, okay, actually that would be true, T-R-U-E. <laughs> that would be backwards logic. If it's true, then it's on, okay, which I could do, and this will logically work. It will do what I say because it does not evaluate to T-R-U-E right now. And it will say list v3 is off. Good, but not good enough. I am a programmer. I am a computer science major. Once upon a time I was. What you can do is there's a, actually there's a second argument. I want to show you this as well is if this property is not set, if nobody defined this, let's say it's the one I made up or maybe it's one I assume is in the system, if it's not there, I don't get a value. I get nothing. You can put in a default that says, look, system, if you don't find it, then default to this value. It could be a string. It could be a number. It could be whatever you want. Uh, but always remember that GS get property is going to return you a string. This is always going to be a string. 
How do you convert a string to a Boolean? Well, my favorite way is to go like this. Just put that out there. Now, it says, get the property. If you don't have one in the system, return F-A-L-S-E as a string and then compare it to this. This is an equation. This is a comparator. The same as we had down here where I was comparing a variable to a literal value, I am comparing two literal values. Does F-A-L-S-E equals true? No. Then it returns a false and it puts it into here. So just by putting that on the end changes the behavior and the data type because JavaScript is loosely data typed. We won't get into that whole discussion right now. And I put that in here and now it says, hey, look, it's now Boolean. It still appears to be false and it works like I want it to. It works like a Boolean. I can treat it as a Boolean simply by putting T-R-U-E on the end of here. If it were a number, if I had expected a number, maybe there's a uh, limit here. And instead of false, I had 100 as the default. There is no property called list v3 limit, trust me. And it's going to return a string, as I mentioned before. Let's take this out. I just want to notice the type and that. It says it's a string, 100, and you run into all kinds of fun when you try to add two numbers together that are not numbers, they're strings. You start concatenating them. What is 100 plus 1? It is 1001 in strings. That's a bad thing. What I want to do is convert that. That's where I could use something like parse int. So just surround that whole thing with a parse int and you're good. Parse int also takes a second parameter that I like to use to specify what number base we're talking. In this case, it is 10. Let me put that in here so it's easier to read. So here's my GS get property, getting my property. If it doesn't have that property, it will get a 100 value. And once it returns that, parse int is going to eat that up and effectively do that. So it's really three val three, two, two things in one. Yes, I could have broken this out and you'd consumed another variable, which would have looked more like this. Take that off, take that off. And then I can say var limit equals parse int. Come on, get it right. List v3, 10. You can use base 8, 16, 2, whatever you want in there. And then change this to limit, change this to limit. And now I will get the same thing. I combined them just for effect in that other one. This one is a little more verbose advantages either way. It is now a number with the value 100. When you add 100 to another number one, you will get 101. So don't be fooled. Properties can get you a little off track sometimes. Just remember, GS property returns strings. You may need to tweak them a little bit to get the right data type. All right. That's going to take us to the top of the hour. I hope you enjoyed that hour of entertainment. This is the community live stream. It's been a great time talking to you, and I hope you have a wonderful weekend. This concludes our show for Friday, July 6th. I will see you again on Monday, July 9th, all things being willing. Remember, if you learned something, first click that like button. You found it helpful, click the like button. That's also appreciated. And share that information, and you will be helping someone else, which is a good thing. That's how communities grow. That's how you become a subject matter expert and you have that engaging discussion. I will see you again on Monday. Until then, have a wonderful time. Take care.